Okay, now that we got through the second noble truth, the cause of suffering section of Life of the Buddha, then we'll go into second noble truth with Lumpur Sumedho. Again, this is from the book, The Four Noble Truths. The second noble truth states that there is an origin of suffering and that the origin of suffering is attachment to the three kinds of desire. Desire for sense pleasure, kama tanha, desire to become, bhava tanha, and desire to get rid of, the bhava tanha. This is the statement of the second noble truth, the thesis, the pariyati. This is what you contemplate. The origin of suffering is attachment to desire. Three kinds of desire. Desire, or tanha in Pali, is an important thing to understand. What is desire? Kama tanha is very easy to understand. This kind of desire is wanting sense pleasures through the body or the other senses, and always seeking things to excite or please your senses. That is kama tanha. You can really contemplate, what is it like when you have desire for pleasure? For example, when you are eating, if you are hungry and the food tastes delicious, you can be aware of wanting to take another bite. Notice that feeling when you are tasting something pleasant, and notice how you, you want more of it. Don't just believe this, try it out. Don't think you know because it has been that way in the past. Try it out when you eat. Taste something delicious and see what happens. A desire arises for more. That is kama tanha. We also contemplate the feeling of wanting to become something. We also contemplate the feeling of wanting to become something. But if there is ignorance, then when we are not seeking something delicious to eat or some beautiful music to listen to, we can be caught in a realm of ambition and attainment, the desire to become. If we get caught in that movement of striving to become happy, seeking to become wealthy, or we might attempt to make our life feel important by endeavoring to make the world right. So note this sense of wanting to become something other than what you are right now. Listen to the Pawa Tanha of your life. I want to practice meditation so I can become free from my pain. I want to become enlightened. I want to become a monk or a nun. I want to become enlightened as a layperson. I want to have a wife and children and a profession. I want to enjoy the sense world without having to give up anything and become an enlightened arhant as well. When we get disillusioned with trying to become something, then there's the desire to get rid of things. So we contemplate vibhava tanha, the desire to get rid of. I want to get rid of my suffering. I want to get rid of my anger. I've got this anger and I want to get rid of it. I want to get rid of jealousy, fear, and anxiety. Notice this as a reflection on vibhava tanha. We are actually contemplating that within ourselves, which we are actually contemplating that within ourselves which wants to get rid of things. We are not trying to get rid of vibhava tanha. We are not taking a stand against the desire to get rid of things, nor are we encouraging that desire. Instead, we are reflecting. It's like this. It feels like this to want to get rid of something. I've got to conquer my anger. I have to kill the devil and get rid of my greed. Then I will become dot, dot, dot. We can see from this train of thought that becoming and getting rid of are very much associated. Bear in mind, though, that these three categories of kama tanha, bhava tanha, and vibhava tanha are merely convenient ways of contemplating desire. They are not totally separate forms of desire, but different aspects of it. The second insight into the second noble truth is desire should be let go of. This is how letting go comes into our practice. You have an insight that desire should be let go of, but that insight is not a desire to let go of anything. 
If you are not very wise and you're not really reflecting in your mind, you tend to follow the, I want to get rid of, I want to let go of all my desires. But this is just another desire. However, you can reflect upon it. You can see the desire to get rid of, the desire to become, or the desire for sense pleasure. By understanding these three kinds of desire, you can let them go. The second noble truth does not ask you to think, I have a lot of sensual desires, or I'm really ambitious, I'm really bhava tanha plus plus plus, or I'm a real nihilist, I just want out, I'm a real vi bhava tanha fanatic, that's me. The second noble truth is not that. It's not about identifying with desires in any way. It's about recognizing desire. I used to spend a lot of time watching how much of my practice was desire to become something. For example, how much of the good intentions of my meditation practice as a monk was to become liked? How much of my relations with other monks or nuns or with lay people had to do with wanting to be liked and approved of? That is bhavatanha, desire for praise and success. As a monk, you have this bhavatanha, wanting people to understand everything and to appreciate the Dhamma. Even these subtle, almost noble desires are bhavatanha. Then there is vibhavatanha in spiritual life, which can be very self-righteous. I want to get rid of, annihilate, and exterminate these defilements. I really listened to myself, thinking, I want to get rid of desire. I want to get rid of anger. I don't want to be frightened or jealous anymore. I want to be brave. I want to have joy and gladness in my heart. This practice of Dhamma is not one of hating oneself for having such thoughts, but really seeing that these are conditioned into the mind. They are impermanent. Desire is not, desire is not what we are, but it is the way we tend to react out of ignorance when we have not understood these Four Noble Truths in their three aspects. We tend to react like this to everything. These are normal reactions due to ignorance. But we need not continue to suffer. We are not just hopeless victims of desire. We can allow desire to be the way it is and so begin to let go of it. Desire has power over us and eludes us only as long as we grasp it, believe in it, and react to it. Grasping is suffering. Usually we equate suffering with feeling, but feeling is not suffering. It is the grasping of desire that is suffering. Desire does not cause suffering. The cause of suffering is the grasping of desire. This statement is for reflection and contemplation in terms of your individual experience. You really have to investigate desire and know it for what it is. You have to know what is natural and necessary for survival and what is not necessary for survival. We can be very idealistic in thinking that even the need for food is some kind of desire we should not have. One can be quite ridiculous about it, but the Buddha was not an idealist and he was not a moralist. He was not trying to condemn anything. He was trying to awaken us to the truth so we could see things clearly. Once there is that clarity and seeing in the right way, then there is no suffering. You can still feel hunger. You can still need food without it becoming a desire. Food is a natural need of the body. The body is not self. It needs food, otherwise it will get very weak and die. That is the nature of the body. There's nothing wrong with that. If we get very moralistic and high-minded and believe that we are our bodies, that hunger is our own problem and that we should not even eat, that is not wisdom, it's foolishness. When you really see the origin of suffering, you realize that the problem is the grasping of desire and not the desire itself. Grasping means being deluded by it, thinking it's really me and mine. These desires are me and there is something wrong with me for having them or I don't like the way I am now, I have to become something else or I have to get rid of something before I can become what I want to be all this is desire, so you listen to it with bare attention, not saying it's good or bad, but merely recognizing it for what it is. 
letting go. If we contemplate desires and listen to them, we are actually no longer attaching to them. We are just allowing them to be the way they are. Then we come to the realization that the origin of suffering, desire, can be laid aside and let go of. How do you let go of things? This means you leave them as they are. It does not mean you annihilate them or throw them away. It is more like setting down and letting them be. Through, through the practice of letting go, we realize that, that there is the origin of suffering, which is the attachment to desire, and we realize that we should let go of these three kinds of desire. Then we realize that we have let go of these desires. There's no longer any attachment to them. When you find yourself attached, remember that letting go is not getting rid of or throwing away. If I'm holding on to this clock and you say, let go of it, that doesn't mean throw it out. I might think I have to throw it away because I'm not attached to it, but that would just be the desire to get rid of it. We tend to think that getting rid of the object is a way to, of getting rid of attachment. But if I can contemplate attachment, the grasping of the clock, I realize that there's no point in getting rid of it. It's a good clock. It keeps good time. It's not too heavy to carry around. The clock is not the problem. The problem is grasping the clock. So what do I do? Let it go. Lay it aside. Put it down gently without any kind of aversion. Then I can pick it up again, see what time it is, and lay it aside when necessary. You can apply this insight into letting go to the desire for sense pleasures. Maybe you want to have a lot of fun. How would you lay aside the desire without any aversion? Simply recognize the desire without judging it. You can contemplate wanting to get rid of it because you feel guilty about having such a foolish desire, but lay it, just lay it aside. Then, when you see it as it is, recognizing that it's just desire, you are no longer attached to it. So the way is always working with the moments of daily life. When you're feeling depressed and negative, just the moment that you refuse to indulge in that feeling is an enlightenment experience. When you see that, you need not sink into the sea of depression and despair and wallow in it. You can actually stop by learning not to give things a second thought. You have to find this out through practice so that you will know for yourself how to let go of the origin of suffering. Can you let go of desire by wanting to let go of it? What is it that is really letting go in a given moment? You have to contemplate the experience of letting go and really examine and investigate until the insight comes. Keep with it until that insight comes. Ah, letting go, yes, now I understand. Desire is being let go of. This does not mean that you're going to let go of desire forever, but at that one moment, you actually have let go and you have done it in full conscious awareness. There is an insight then. This is what we call insight knowledge. In Pali, we call it jnana dasana, or profound understanding. I had my first insight into letting go in my first year of meditation. I figured out intellectually that you had to let go of everything and then I thought, how do you let go? It seemed impossible to let go of anything. I kept on contemplating, how do you let go? Then I would say, you let go by letting go. Well then, let go. Then I would say, but have I let go yet? And how do you let go? Just let go. I went on like that, getting more frustrated. But eventually it became obvious what was happening. If you try to analyze letting go in detail, you get caught up in making it very complicated. It was not something you could figure out in words anymore, but just but something you actually did. So I just let go for a moment, just like that. Now with personal problems and obsessions, to let go of them is just that much. It's not a matter of analyzing and endlessly making more of a problem out of them but of practicing that state of leaving things alone, letting go of them. At first, you let go, but then you pick them up again because the habit of grasping is so strong. But at least you have the idea. 
Even when I had that insight into letting go, I let go for a moment, but then I started grasping by thinking, I can't do it. I have so many bad habits. But don't trust that kind of nagging, disparaging thing in yourself. It is totally untrustworthy. It is just a matter of practicing letting go. The more you begin to see how to do it, then the more you are able to sustain the state of non-attachment. Accomplishment. It is important to know when you have let go of desire, when you lo no longer judge or try to get rid of it, when you recognize that it's just the way it is, when you are really calm and peaceful, then you will find that there is no attachment to anything. You're not caught up trying to get something or trying to get rid of something. Well-being is just knowing things as they are without feeling the necessity to pass judgment upon them. We say all the time, this shouldn't be like this, I shouldn't be this way, and you shouldn't be like this, and you shouldn't do that, and so on. I'm sure I could tell you what you should be, and you could tell me what I should be. We should be kind, loving, generous, good-hearted, hardworking, diligent, courageous, brave, and compassionate. I don't have to know you at all to tell you that, but to really know you, I'd have to open up to you rather than start from an ideal about a woman, how a woman or a man should be, what a Buddhist should be or what a Christian should be. It's not that. We don't know, we don't know what we should be. Our suffering comes from the attachment that we have to ideal. Our suffering comes from the attachment that we have to idealize and the complexities we create about the way things are. We are never what we should be according to our highest ideals. Life, others, the country we are in, the world we live in, things never seem to be what they should be. We become very critical of everything and of ourselves. I know I should be more patient, but I just can't be patient. Listen to all the shoulds and the should nots and the desires, wanting the pleasant, wanting to become, or wanting to get rid of the ugly and the painful. It's like listening to somebody talking over the fence, saying, I want this and I don't like that. It should be this way and it shouldn't be that way. Really take time to listen to the complaining mind. Bring it to consciousness. I used to do a lot of this when I felt discontented or critical. I would close my eyes and start thinking, I don't like this and I don't want that. That person shouldn't be like this, and the world shouldn't be like that. I would keep listening to this kind of critical demon that would go on and on, criticizing me, you and the w criticizing me, you and the world. Then I would think, I want happiness and comfort. I want to feel safe. I want to be loved. I would deliberately think these things out and listen to them in order to know them simply as conditions that arise in the mind. So bring them up in your mind. Arouse all the hopes, desires, and criticisms. Bring them into consciousness. Then you will know desire and be able to lay it aside. The more we contemplate and investigate grasping, the more the insight arises. Desire should be let go of. Then, through the actual practice and understanding of what letting go really is, we have the third insight into the second noble truth, which is, desire has been let go of. We actually know letting go. It is not a theoretical letting go, but a direct insight. You know letting go has been accomplished. This is what practice is all about. And then moving on to the third noble truth, but before that, is there any questions or comments about the second noble truth? Uh, a few nights ago, I, I brought up the question of this uh, practice of the they don't know mind. If I remember correctly, it's like in Zen, you hear a lot in Zen, you don't know, don't know. And, and I remember that some people can use that in a way where it just causes confusion, but it seems like in other ways you can use it. 
to let go of the sense that I know everything or things like that? Do you have any reflection on that? I, for myself, it's, I think I like not sure better necessarily than don't know, but uh, I don't know if Long Pa has any comments on that as well. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> I mean, you can, we have these way, we have these kind of uh, creative ways of confounding ourselves. And sometimes those types of teachings can become that. Sort of like just rather than just meditating and cultivating clarity, we can get into this kind of like, don't know, don't know, kind of like these kind of tie ourselves up in knots. It's like any kind of a tool. You can, it, it, it's, it's something to be learned how to use skillfully. And not that. I remember uh, someone who was at a previous winter retreat and uh, they were starting to learn about samsara and the whole Buddhist cosmology and had this, uh, woke up one morning and thought, you know, it, it's possible that actually um, now it's actually 500 aeons in the future and, but I'm just in a universe now that is extremely similar to 500 aeons ago, but maybe things are just slightly different and off and kind of getting in this kind of confounded state. And, you know, you went to sleep last night and woke up. And so <laughs> but we, but like the mind picks up these kind of ideas. And, and confounding ideas. Yeah, confounding ideas. <laughs> Or is like taking the not sure teaching and then saying, well, maybe, maybe there is no such thing as the Four Noble Truths. Maybe, maybe there is no Dhamma. Maybe, maybe Kama doesn't have any efficacy or trying to start to apply it kind of, kind of in the wrong way rather than use it as a tool for investigation. Doubt grabs a hold of it. Yeah, I think that's where the, uh, <coughs> I mean, one is just a contemplation of cause and effect and what effect is being elicited and, uh, and the uh, um, sort of uh, tuning in to that, that wholesome, unwholesome uh, qualities that, that are being 
Okay, we'll continue on. This is now Third Noble Truth. The whole aim of the Buddhist teaching is to develop the reflective mind in order to let go of delusions. The Four Noble Truths is a teaching about letting go by investigating or looking into, contemplating, why is it like this? Why is it this way? It is good to ponder over things like why monks shave their heads or why Buddha Rupas look the way they do. We contemplate. The mind is not forming an opinion about whether these are good, bad, useful or useless. The mind is actually opening and considering. What does this mean? What do the monks represent? Why do they carry alms bulls? Why can't they have money? Why can't they grow their own food? We contemplate how this way of living has sustained the tradition and allowed it to be handed down from its original founder, Gotama the Buddha, to the present time. We reflect as we see suffering, as we see the nature of desire, as we recognize that attachment, to, that attachment to desire is suffering. These insights can only come through reflection. They cannot come through belief. You cannot make yourself believe or realize an insight as a willful act. Through really contemplating and pondering these truths, the insights come to you. They come only through the mind being open and receptive to the teaching. Blind belief is certainly not advised or expected of anyone. Instead, the mind should be willing to be receptive, pondering, and considering. This mental state is very important. It's the way out of suffering. It is not the mind which has fixed views and prejudices and thinks it knows it all, or which just takes what other people say as being the truth. It is the mind that is open to these Four Noble Truths and can reflect upon something that we can see within our own mind. People rarely realize non-suffering because it takes a special kind of willingness in order to ponder and investigate and get beyond the gross and the obvious. It takes a willingness to actually look at your own reactions, to be able to see the attachments and to contemplate what does attachment feel like? For example, do you feel happy or liberated by being attached to desire? Is it uplifting or depressing? These questions are for you to investigate. If you find out that being attached to your desires is liberating, then do that. Attach to all your desires and see what the result is. In my practice, I have seen that attachment to my desires is suffering. There is no doubt about that. I can see how much suffering in my life has been caused by attachments to material things, ideas, attitudes, or fears. I can see all kinds of unnecessary misery that I have caused myself through attachment because I did not know any better. I was brought up in America, the land of freedom. It promises the right to be happy. But what it really offers is the right to be attached to everything. America encourages you to try to be as happy as you can by getting things. However, if you are working with the Four Noble Truths, attachment is to be understood and contemplated. Then the insight into non-attachment arises. This is not an intellectual stand or a, or a command from your brain saying that you should not be attached. It's just a natural insight into non-attachment or non-suffering. The Truth of Impermanence. Here at Amaravati, we chant the Dhammachakapavatana Sutta in its traditional form. When the Buddha gave this sermon on the Four Noble Truths, only one of the five disciples who listened to it really understood it. Only one had the profound insight. The other four rather liked it, thinking, very nice teaching indeed. But only one of them, Kondanya, really had the perfect understanding of what the Buddha was saying. The devas were also listening to the sermon. Devas are celestial, ethereal creatures, vastly superior to us. 
They do not have coarse bodies like ours. They have ethereal bodies, and they are beautiful and lovely, intelligent. Now, although they were delighted to hear the sermon, not one of them was enlightened by it. We are told that they became very happy about the Buddha's enlightenment, and that they shouted up through the heavens when they heard his teaching. First, one level of devata heard it, then they shouted up to the next level, and soon all the devas were rejoicing right up to the highest, the Brahma realm. There was resounding joy that the wheel of Dhamma was set rolling, and these devas and Brahmas were rejoicing in it. However, only Kondanya, one of the five disciples, was enlightened when he heard this sermon. At the very end of the sutta, the Buddha called him Anya Kondanya. Anya means profound knowing. So Anya Kondanya means Kondanya who knows. What did Kondanya know? What was his insight that the, that the Buddha praised at the very end of the sermon? It was, all that is subject to arising is subject to ceasing. Now this may not sound like any great knowledge, but what it really implies is a universal pattern. Whatever is subject to arising is subject to ceasing. It is impermanent and not self. So don't attach, don't be deluded by what arises and ceases. Don't look for your refuges, that which you want to abide in and trust, in anything that arises, because those things will cease. If you want to suffer and waste your life, go around seeking things that arise. They will all take you to the end, to cessation, and you will not be any the wiser for it. You'll just go around repeating the same old dreary habits, and when you die, you will not have learned anything important from your life. Rather than just thinking about it, really contemplate. All that is subject to arising is subject to ceasing. Apply it to life in general, to your own experience. Then you will understand. Just note, beginning, ending. Contemplate how things are. This sensory realm is all about arising and ceasing, beginning and ending. There can be perfect understanding, samaditi, in this lifetime. I don't know how long Kondanya lived after the Buddha's sermon, but he was enlightened at that moment. Right then, he had perfect understanding. I would like to emphasize how important it is to develop this way of reflecting. Rather than just developing a method of tranquilizing your mind, which certainly is one part of the practice, really see that proper meditation is a commitment to wise investigation. It involves a courageous effort to look deeply into things, not analyzing yourself and making judgments about why you suffer on a personal level, but resolving to really follow the path until you have profound understanding. Such perfect understanding is based upon the pattern of arising and ceasing. Once this law is understood, everything is seen as fitting into that pattern. And this is not a metaphysical teaching. All that is subject to arising is subject to ceasing. It is not about the ultimate reality, the deathless reality. But if you profoundly understand and know that all that is subject to arising is subject to ceasing, then you will realize the ultimate reality, the deathless, immortal truths. This is a skillful means to that ultimate realization. Notice the difference. The statement is not a metaphysical one, but one which takes us to the metaphysical realization. <clears throat> Mortality and cessation. With the reflection upon the noble truths, we bring into consciousness this very problem of human existence. We look at this sense of alienation and blind attachment to sensory consciousness, the attachment to that which is separate and stands forth in consciousness. Out of ignorance, we attach to desires for sense pleasures. When we identify with what is mortal or death bound, and with what is unsatisfactory, that very attachment is suffering. Sense pleasures are all mortal pleasures. Whatever we see, hear, touch, taste, think, or feel is mortal, death-bound. So when we attach to the mortal senses, we attach to death. 
If we have not contemplated or understood it, we just attach blindly to mortality, hoping that we can stave it off for a while. We pretend that we're going to be really happy with the things we attach to, only to feel eventually disillusioned, despairing, and disappointed. We might succeed in becoming what we want, but that too is mortal. We're attaching to another death-bound condition. Then, with the desire to die, we might attach to suicide or annihilation, but death itself is yet another death-bound condition. Whatever we attach to in these three kinds of desires, we are attaching to death which means that we're going to experience disappointment or despair. Death of the mind is despair. Depression is a kind of death experience of the mind. Just as the body dies, a physical death, the mind dies. Mental states and mental conditions die. We call it despair, boredom, depression, and anguish. Whenever we attach, if we're experiencing boredom, despair, anguish, and sorrow, we tend to seek some other mortal condition that's arising. As an example, you feel despair and you think, I want a piece of chocolate cake. Off you go. For a moment, you can absorb into the sweet, delicious chocolate flavor of that piece of cake. At that moment, there's becoming. You've actually become the sweet, delicious chocolate flavor. But you can't hold on to that for very long. You swallow and what's left? Then you have to go on and do something else. This is becoming. We are blinded, caught in this becoming process on the sensual plane. But through knowing desire without judging the beauty or ugliness of the sensual plane, we come to see desire as it is. There's knowing. Then, by laying aside these desires rather than grasping at them, we experience nirodha, the cessation of suffering. This is the third noble truth, which we must realize for ourselves. We contemplate cessation. We say, there is cessation, and we know when something has ceased. I'll leave it there for today. Any more questions, comments? So we, right now we can notice the non-arising of suffering in terms of the non-arising of the woodpeckers. And usually we don't notice that. So when it's not there, we don't notice it. We only notice it when it's there. I think that phrase, uh, the Dhamma I opening, and then that's the realization. So from listening to the Four Noble Truths and contemplating them and following them with his mind, then the Dhamma I opens. And when the Dhamma I opens, what is seen is all that arises passes away and is not self. So that you could get into that phrase for a long time too, because it's also there's a hint at the sameness of arising and passing away, the same, the anicca, the meaning, the deeper meaning of anicca. And uh, that, that it is interesting that that's what's seen when the Dhamma eye opens. Um, because I think it's like Mopor was telling his brother or something, asking about Buddhism, like, what, what's Buddhism about? And he said, well, impermanence. Well, that, everybody knows about that.
but <laughs> but it but actually nobody knows about it deeply. It's <laughs> say one was for pleasure, one was for teaching. You can look at it in a wholesome way and say, well, if it's teaching, that's good, you're spreading the Dhamma. If it's personal pleasure, that's just desire. You want to get away. If you're dispassionate about it, then you're unattached. Then it doesn't really matter the reason for going. But should that guide your ultimate decision? Yeah, for, for myself, it's like... Uh you kind of answered your own question, um, the dispassion, because of seeing the, the impermanent nature of desire, that it arises and passes away, then there's a sense of dispassion for it. But then also, if you have a choice of whether to do something or not do something, you try to, you try to see with discernment, is it for my own benefit, is it for the benefit of others, is it for the benefit of both, or is it not for my own benefit, not for the benefit of others, not for the benefit of both. So like a pleasure trip to Thailand, and if it has nothing to do with Dhamma, like you want to go to Ko Phi Phi or something and hang out, uh, then it's not for my own benefit because it's just going to be, you know, there's a, it's just like that grasping at, that grasping at sense pleasure. It's not going to be for the benefit of others because it's not like you're teaching or helping anybody. So it's not for the benefit of both. So, so then it's like, well, okay, that's... But then if you invite to, say, go teach Dhamma somewhere, like, okay, well, that'll benefit me and that I get to clarify my own understanding. It'll benefit others because it'll help them to perhaps suffer less and benefit both. So then it's an obvious kind of choice. And there might be other considerations as well. what are the side benefits of going or something like a little unwholesome desire might get in there a little bit, but that's also to be expected if you're not finished with the path yet. You might be like, oh yeah, I can go teach and I can also go snorkeling or something, you know, but uh, <laughs> so there might be little side things there and uh, or that might, you know, who knows, you might consider that as a benefit for another because they get to offer that or something like that and you, you get to honor that um, so it's subtle and I won't bore any comments as well on that yeah. no, that's, kind of, that's kind of it you know, sort of looking at it from various angles but it's, it's, uh, it's very much the, that sense of, of uh, one what's the intention and, and what's, the, what's the fruit of that desires or aspirations about what I was going to do after the retreat and you, you pointed out that there's this 
sense of like me somewhere else being happy. And it's almost kind of like uh, the mind has to have some sort of object, but it's rather, is it, is it going to the unwholesome or the wholesome? It's like <coughs> very rarely is there going to be just nothing there. So it's trying to direct it skillfully, trying to direct it to the wholesome. If it's just sort of floating, like if we try to be in a state of just emptiness or nothingness, the mind will be kind of floating and it'll magnetize to whatever is like the most magnetic <laughs> for us. <laughs> Whichever hindrance, whichever hindrance is the most habitual or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> 